Welcome to chapter 11. This chapter is titled Data Collection Methods, and that is sort of the theme of the week. Um, that's where we are at in our research project is developing our methods for collecting our data. And depending on the method and design that we're going to use to collect data, we will need a tool to measure our variables, and that tool is called a measure. For example, if I wanted to give someone a cognitive test um, to see if they were showing symptoms of Alzheimer's, the cognitive test that I develop would be a measure of the variable symptoms of Alzheimer's. And then if I wanted to poll people to see who they were going to vote for in an election, the poll that I create would be a measure. If I were to write a single demographic question to collect data on one of my variables, um, say the variable was something real straightforward like age, um, I could write a single demographic question, just what is your age? And that would be my measure for that variable. I can write an entire questionnaire um, that would maybe measure more complex or multi-dimensional variables, ones that are a little less straightforward and more ambiguous in nature like uh, faith or partying or uh, sexual satisfaction. These are all variables that have a lot of different uh, factors and dimensions that go into um, how someone feels about those variables or how someone reacts to those variables. And so a big old questionnaire that measures, um, let's say partying for example, would be another example of what we call a measure. So in this lecture, we are going to talk about all the different data collection methods and all the different measures um, that are created to collect data on variables. Um, and so let's dive in. So the first major category of data collection methods is observational research. So let's say that we wanted to do some observational research, which is really the most kind of obvious way to collect data, right? Just watch people and record what you see. Um, and we do this all the time as people. Really, the only difference between the casual watcher and the researcher is the way they go about collecting the data um, or the systematic recording of behavior. So we're going to talk about the different ways to collect data for these three different types of observational research, naturalistic, participant, and laboratory. It's important to note that all of these uh, types of observational research are non-experimental research designs. Um, they don't have a control group. There's not a variable being manipulated, but they can still be valuable sources of data. Um, like we've talked about before, you have a person in their natural environment in most cases, or if you're doing participant observation, you're undercover. Um, so you might get really truthful, honest, accurate data in those situations. So Observational research has its benefits, but it is not a true experiment. Um, so the steps to the methods for doing observational research so that you can collect data are as follows. The first is to develop a research question so that we can identify our variables and create a hypothesis. You already know this. Second is to operationally define those variables. Um, so we want to know exactly what it is that we're looking for and communicate that clearly to all the people that will be doing the observations in the study so that we all have a clear understanding of what it is that we're looking for and so we know what to record and we're all looking for and recording the same behaviors. So let's say that we wanted to do observational research to collect data on the variable flirting. So this is a slide from my uh, human sexuality class, one of my lectures. Um, and so as you see here on the slide, it, it shows you the five um, components of flirting, and they usually do happen in this order. Um, but the first one is the approach. The second one is a uh, talk. Next one is swivel and turn, which is just that people, when they're flirting, they usually start standing like shoulder to shoulder and then start turning towards each other, kind of uh, swiveling in. And then touch, which is like touching someone on the arm or leg or um, you know, telling someone, oh, you have an eyelash on your face. It usually appears kind of accidental during flirting. And then there's synchronization, which when people are kind of deep into the flirting, 
they start like mimicking each other's body movements unconsciously. So like if someone touches their face, it's common that we'll see the other person they're flirting with touch their face. But at any rate, uh, the point of this is that if you wanted to study flirting, what you would have to do in observational research is look at the existing literature, see what they know about flirting. And here uh, research shows that these are kind of the five elements of it. And so then what you would do, or you know, you could look at this as the five dimensions of flirting. And so then what you would do is take each of these dimensions and you would create an observation recording sheet and you would have a column for each one of these dimensions on it. So if you picture a blank piece of paper and then uh, the first column being put on it would be the approach and then you'd set, put another column right next to that and it would be talk and the next one would be swivel and turn, touch and synchronization. And this recording sheet would constitute the measure that you're using uh, to collect the data. And then um, you would need to make sure everyone in your research team has a clear understanding of these five dimensions and what behaviors comprise the, these dimensions. Um, and they would need to look for those exact behaviors. And every time they saw those behaviors, they would put a tally under the appropriate dimension, um, under the appropriate column on their recording sheet. So if they saw two people start to swivel and turn, they would go ahead and put a tally under that um, column on their recording sheet. So then observational research, um, the data is normally collected as a frequency um, because the researchers are there, you know, taking tallies of every time they see the behavior and then they count up all those tallies um, and that gives them a number that represents the frequency of the behaviors or a simple count of how often a behavior occurred. Okay, so um, after you have your kind of recording sheet set up, you've operationally defined your variables, um, then the next step is to kind of figure out exactly how the observing is going to go. Um, and we call this the design. So the first step in the design is to choose the participants. So you obviously have to figure out who the participants are going to be and where you can find them. So um, if you are going to be measuring the variable college student stress, then you would want to choose participants that are college students um, and you would obviously find them on a college campus or in a college database. Um, and then you need to choose which participants you're going to observe. If you're going to observe um, specific People, if you're going to have one specific focal point per observer, if you're going to be looking at a group of people. Um, so you need to be real clear on who the participants are and which of those participants are being observed. And then the next step is to figure out how the observers are going to observe. So sometimes uh, researchers will take video, sometimes researchers will have an audio recorder, or they will just sit and record using their naked eye. Um, and then the next thing you will need to do is figure out where the observers are going to be located. Are they going to be behind a one-way mirror? Are they going to be in the actual setting, um, kind of all spread out if there's multiple researchers? Um, or if there's multiple researchers, are they going to be all kind of at the same space so they have the same viewpoint? So that would have to be determined in advance. And then the next step is um, to try to obtain what we call inter-rater reliability. And this is just that uh, the people that are doing the observation and making the tallies on the behaviors they are seeing, when they go back to the lab and they compare their tallies for their behaviors, um, they should match up. They should be pretty similar. So if we're all watching Joe uh, flirt, then we should all have the same kind of tallies for the number of times he does the swivel and turn or synchronization, for example. If we don't all have the same number of tallies or very close to the same number of tallies, then we would say we do not have inter-rater reliability. Um, so one of the ways to try to increase the likelihood of having inter-rater reliability is to use multiple observers and then compare those observations um, and 
just sort of keep checking as you go throughout the observation to make sure that you guys are on the same page. Not altering the data or anything, but let's say you do one round of observations and you're watching Joe, and then you come back with 15 examples of synchronization and your research partner comes back with two. It's good to just pause and go, okay, let's look back at our operational definitions. Let's look back at the dimensions of uh, flirting and let's figure out why we're not seeing the same um, behavior. Is it because we're viewing the behavior differently or is it because one of us is not accurately seeing what's going on and so you kind of can look at what issues are occurring in your observational uh, data collection method and then make adjustments to that as you go and what you want to do is make sure you avoid bias um, while you are doing your observation one thing that's common in observational research is what's called observer bias. And observer bias is the tendency of, of observers to see what they expect to see rather than what's actually going on. Um, and so they might be unconsciously ignoring actions that don't fit their expectations, um, that don't fit with you know their dimensions that they have created to define their construct. So some techniques to avoid observer bias are to have blind observers. So for example, you don't tell the observers that the um, variable is flirting. Maybe you just give them the recording sheet that you've made with the dimensions on it and you tell them just look for these behaviors. They don't know what your hypothesis is. They're not clear on the variables that you're measuring or trying to correlate or whatever it is that your research is attempting to do. They don't know any of that. They're just people that have been hired to look for these five elements of flirting and they have no idea if your hypothesis hopes to see the elements or doesn't hope to see the elements so therefore then it helps to prevent any sort of bias from sneaking into your um, study also multiple observers can help prevent observer bias because it provides like a checks and balance system um, and so the length of observations are usually around 30 minutes, which is really challenging actually. And when I teach this class in person, I have students do naturalistic observation on campus. And afterwards we, we report, um, you know, how difficult it actually is to do this type of observation and collect data. It's, it's, it's difficult to sit for 30 minutes and focus and concentrate and look for specific behaviors. It's harder than people would think. Um, so 30 minutes is a long time for observation, but that's the normal length. A lot of people nowadays are switching to using video because it's a little bit more accurate um, and you can pause, you can rewind, you, you can freeze frames. So there's a lot more that you um, can do when you record the observations by video. And we're seeing a lot of people switch to that. And one of the methods that they use is looking at the uh, video in 10 second kind of uh, chunks of time so they look for 10 seconds record all the behaviors they see they might go back they might stop and compare with the other observers to make sure that uh, they're observing in the same way and then they do the next 10 second interval and they just keep proceeding um, on and on until they get through the entire video Okay, so let's talk about naturalistic observation, uh, which is the first kind of observational research method that we are going to talk about. So naturalistic observation involves an investigator recording what they observe without making any changes to the situation whatsoever. Um, they just observe the naturally occurring behavior in its natural setting. There's not a lab manipulation. There's not a manipulation to a variable, as we mentioned. Um, and so with naturalistic observation, there are pros and cons. Uh, one of the pros is that we can see what people do in their natural habitat without changes in behavior due to labs or tests or fabricated stimuli. So there's a lot of external validity with naturalistic observation um, generally because we are watching people in their natural environment. And then uh, a con of this type of data collection method is that we can't control any of the factors that are going on in the environment. Um, so we can't always draw conclusions. We can't discuss cause and effect. We can't make causal inferences uh, when we're doing naturalistic observation. And the other con of this type of research is that nothing notable may happen. We may have to wait for things to naturally occur. Um, and this can cost a lot of time and money. Some of the other cons of naturalistic observation are that it can be challenging to know what it is that you're supposed to be looking for. Um, 
we can clearly define the behaviors at the outset like we talked about in the previous slide but there's always room for some subjectivity in what we mean by a certain behavior so uh, someone might consider touching flirting while another observer does not consider that type of touch flirting um, so it can be tricky to know exactly what we're looking for um, this type of data can be collected as a frequency count like we talked about on the previous slide just making tallies of every time you see the behavior. It can also be collected as a qualitative measure where ob um, observers just take kind of freestyle notes of what they're seeing and then they go back later and do a content analysis, um, although that's very time consuming um, and, and often leaves the researcher open to more subjectivity and more bias than a structured systematic frequency count. Um, but at any rate, one of the best things about this type of data collection method is that if the researcher is able to kind of put themselves in a situation where they're watching behavior, but the people being watched are not aware that they're being watched, then we're really able to limit or negate what we call the Hawthorne effect, or I think your book calls it the reactivity effect. So I'm pretty sure we've discussed this concept before, but just as a refresher, this is the tendency for people to alter their behavior when they know they are being watched. So if an observer just, you know, wants to watch kids play at a playground to measure aggressiveness or whatever, they that observer, that researcher could just go sit on a park bench and watch and no one would have any idea what they were doing. So naturalistic observation has been used to answer research questions like how does a child new to daycare behave when their parents leave? What does a whale born in a zoo do when released into the ocean? How do brides behave at a bridal show? And here I have another more detailed example for you. So here is an article by The Atlantic, and it discusses some research that was done by um, the research arm of an advertising firm. Let me show you the quote. So what they did was um, they took the recordings of this customer service department in this company, Marchex, and there were 600,000 phone calls that the company had gotten in the past 12 months, um, customer service calls. And so these particular researchers were interested in identifying which state cursed the most, said bad words, um, F-bombs and stuff. So they used um, some call mining technology. You see, that's what it's referred to in the quote there. Um, to find the curse words in within these calls and then they cross-referenced the calls against the states where the calls were placed from and that's how they were able to determine who cursed the most who cursed the least all of that and so this is a form of naturalistic observation because the people uh, were behaving completely normal in a natural environment where they just called up to complain about something um, maybe they called to give kudos to who knows but they called the customer service department um, and they were being recorded um, you know how when you call they tell you this call may be recorded um, and so they knew they were being recorded but we all hear that all the time right so it's kind of like not really going to trigger that reactivity effect in the same way that um, you know being in a laboratory and being watched might trigger that reactivity effect all right, so let me tell you what the findings were. Uh, people in Ohio cursed the most as compared to every other state in the union. I'm just reading this right off the article. They swore in one out of about every 150 phone conversations. And then Ohio was followed by Mary, uh, Maryland, New Jersey, Louisiana, and Illinois. And the state that swore the least was Washington. And then the researchers were also interested in what states were the courteous, the most courteous. So they measured that mostly just with like basic manners, how often the um, people calling in said please and thank you, for example. And so the results from that were that the most courteous was South Carolina. And then the least courteous in this case was Wisconsin. Okay, so as your uh, screen shows... Some other fun facts from this research were 66% of curses came from men. The calls that contain the most cursing are more than 10 minutes long. So the longer someone is on the phone, the more likely that call is to devolve. 
And then calls in the morning are twice as likely to produce cursing as calls in the afternoon or evening. So this was a great way to use naturalistic observation to limit that reactivity or Hawthorne effect. So the next data collection method we are going to discuss is another one under that category of observational non-experimental research and it is called participant observation and again uh, we've discussed this type of data collection method previously but we'll go in a little more detail here. So. Um, this type of observation is when the observer, the researcher, becomes a participant in the group being observed. And there are two ways to do participant observation. Overt participant observation, when everybody is aware that you are a researcher and you are there to observe. Or covert participant observation, which is where you go into the group undercover and they have no idea that you are a researcher and that you are there observing them. Um, so if you were going to do this type of research, some research questions that you could use this kind of data collection method to answer would be, what goes on inside of a prison, a sorority, an AA meeting, a cult, like uh, Jonestown, as you see on your slide, a gang, a mental hospital. So generally we use participant observation um, when we want to study existing groups of people that are living some type of way. Um, in a lot of cases, this type of observation is used for measuring populations that really are not that interested in being measured. And that's especially true of covert participant observation. Um, gang members might not be really interested in contributing to the scientific knowledge on gangs, um, and so it might be appropriate to go into the gang undercover as if you really are a person who is interested in joining a gang. Um, so the steps that are involved in this type of part in this type of data collection method is first you have to determine if observation is an appropriate strategy for your research question, for your participants, um, for the situation. And then the next step is to ask yourself as the researcher, what group, process, or activities am I going to be observing here? After that, you'll need to gain entry into the group. Um, this can be maybe the hardest part of this type of data collection method, especially if you're studying a group that doesn't really want to be studied. They um, might be doing something that is illegal or dangerous. Um, and so it can be really hard to get invited into those types of groups. But one thing that can help and what researchers do is identify what's often referred to as a gatekeeper, a person that can help you gain entrance into the group. Um, and so sometimes this could be an informant uh, that helps people get into a group. Like, for example, this is used in police work all the time. Um, informants will bring undercover cops into the group um, that they are investigating or whatever. Um, and then finally, once you have gained access to the group that you want to observe, then what you do is observe and record field notes. Uh, so field notes are just detailed reports on what the researcher is experiencing. And then those uh, detailed reports, those field notes are evaluated after observation using content analysis. Um, and so the pros of this type of data uh, collection method is that it provides information, a framework for future quantitative research about what variables seem important. Um, also, this type of research has high external validity, um, again, because it's occurring in a natural setting and it's not fabricated in any way by a lab, it's easier to generalize it to other related settings. Um, <clears throat> And then once a researcher is accepted into the group, um, they can get like a deeper level of data than they might get from less immersive methods of data collection, like questionnaires or polls, for example. Um, they might be able to see behaviors that the you know, participants themselves are not aware that they're doing or, or wouldn't have consciously reported um, because it's like a habit or an automatic thing that they do, so they don't even think of it. Um, they might have behaviors that they aren't comfortable sharing because they don't feel that that makes them um, 
look in the best light or doesn't put them in the best light. So instead, uh, they wouldn't report that if we were giving them a questionnaire. But now, since they're being observed um, and the person is living with them and being around them all the time, they might become more relaxed and do more natural behaviors. Participant observation also has the added bonus of adding another layer of data, which we don't often have using other methods, which is the researcher's own subjective experiences of what it's like to be a part of that group. So what's interesting is while that is a pro, um, meaning that the researcher is really getting an immersive, full, comprehensive experience of what is going on, and they're able to, especially if they're good researcher, researchers, try to um, perceive what's going on as objectively as possible and then also record what they saw as objectively as possible. However, as you know, we're human, we're not perfect, and it's impossible to negate all subjectivity. So while that is a pro, it is also a con. Um, so the subjectivity can be a pro or a con to this type of a data collection. It could help the accuracy and validity of your data or your own subjectivity could cause you to perceive things incorrectly or um, only look for certain behaviors and miss out on other behaviors. So it can also be kind of a detriment. Um, and then, as we talked about before, it can be incredibly difficult to gain access to a group. Um, this type of research obviously takes a lot of time and can be very expensive. And then as it pertains to covert participant observation, obviously it can be very dangerous to your physical or mental health if the group you are joining is doing anything of the like. And a covert participant observation can also put researchers in a position where they have to decide if they are willing to engage in unethical or illegal behavior to kind of keep up the ruse of them not being a researcher but just being a regular guy that wanted to join a gang or whatever. Um, and so if they're asked to become involved in criminal or distasteful activity, they have to kind of decide if that's something that they want to do or not. Um, if they do decide that they're going to engage in, let's say, a drive-by shooting for the purposes of science, there is no legal protection for the researcher. They would not be able to go before a judge and say, hey, I know I was there at the drive-by shooting, but I was there for science, so I'm good, right? The judge would say, no, sir, you're still going to jail. So um, it's also possible, as we've discussed before with the pro Anna example, that a researcher will go native, um, and that can obviously be very dangerous. So I have two examples of participant observation that are relatively famous uh, for you. One kind of illustrates the dangers of being a researcher and going into um, research covertly. And then the one following that um, is just a really interesting example of researchers doing participant observation in a cult. So you're going to watch those back to back. There's always been madness. But it wasn't until the 19th century that it came to be seen as a disease, to be managed by a new group of experts, psychiatrists. New asylums were built, their walls and bars marking the supposedly clear-cut boundary between the sane and the insane. But in 1887, an enterprising journalist called Elizabeth Cochran, who wrote under the name of Nellie Bly, challenged this. Nellie Bly was on a mission to test out psychiatry. So what she did, she checked into a boarding house and she started pulling strange faces and tugging her hair out and saying everyone around her was crazy. And sure enough, it wasn't long before two doctors had her shipped off to the woman's lunatic asylum in New York. Once inside, she behaved perfectly normally, but it made no difference. As she later wrote, the saner I acted, the crazier they thought I was. Her articles and her book, Ten Days in a Madhouse, showed just how easy it had been to fool the doctors and just how terrible conditions were inside the asylum. 85 years later, a clinical psychologist called David Rosenhan would do much the same thing.
The 1960s was a time of social and cultural revolution. Established ideas, institutions and professions were questioned, and one of them was psychiatry. The 1970s were a very turbulent period for psychiatry. Um, at the time, there were a group of psychiatrists, well, in the 1960s anyway, and going through to the 70s, there were a group of psychiatrists who actually badged themselves as anti-psychiatrists. The medical model saying that this is a, a largely physical thing, that people have become mentally ill, and the anti-psychiatry movement was saying that perhaps we should, we should see this in a different way. Thomas Satz argued that psychiatry was a pseudoscience, and the very idea of mental illness was a myth. Irving Goffman suggested that just being in a mental hospital was enough to drive people insane. And R.D. Lang claimed that what psychiatry said was mental illness was just a rational response to an insane world. What bound them together was objection, a horror at the way that psychiatry was being practiced. In those days, people were largely just incarcerated in big hospitals. I mean, we used to call them loony bins, and in a way, although it's a pejorative, it's a, it, it, is like, it was like a dustbin for people, really. It was horrible. It's a space where you can meet with her, where she's not going to be frightened. R.D. Lang was the most famous of these anti-psychiatrists. It was while listening to one of Lang's lectures that David Rosenhan wondered if there might be a way of actually testing the reliability of psychiatric diagnoses. Can we really tell the sane from the insane? So one evening he called some friends and students and asked them if they'd like to take part in an experiment. His idea was to see if they could get themselves admitted to hospitals as psychiatric patients. And surprisingly, seven of them, three women and four men, agreed. One of them, Martin Seligman, now himself a world-famous psychologist, later explained that Rosenhan could be very persuasive. And he had to be, because this was a tough assignment. I think it had been very frightening for the pseudo-patients when they turn up. These institutions, very intimidating. They have a certain smell to them. However much you see pictures of them, it's nothing like walking in. It's a, it's a physical experience. Of the, there's, you really can't put it into words, the smell, the experience, the feeling of the place, it's intimidating. The would-be patients, none of whom had any history of psychiatric disorder, practiced their roles including how to avoid swallowing the mass of tablets they'd be sure to be given. They stopped shaving, showering and brushing their teeth. And five days later, they set off. And so began one of the most notorious experiments ever conducted in psychology, an experiment from which psychiatry never quite recovered. Rosenhan and his confederates travelled to 12 hospitals in five different states in the US. To try to get a more representative sample, some of the hospitals were old, some new, some were short-staffed, others well-staffed. After calling for an appointment, the would-be patients presented themselves at the hospitals. They didn't act crazy like Nellie Bly had done, they just faked a single symptom. Yes, when the pseudo patients turn up at the hospital, they would just say, I'm hearing a voice and it's saying to me, hollow, empty, thud. And the significance of this uh, is that it doesn't represent any known symptom of a schizophrenic disorder. Uh, so it's quite unique, it's made up. It, no one would have accounted anything like this before. So Rosenhan was giving the doctors a chance here. And apart from saying they heard the voice and giving a false ID, Everything else the pseudo patient said was true. Significant events in their life were described exactly as they'd been. And then what happened? They were all diagnosed as insane and admitted to the hospital. All of them. All of them. Once admitted, the pseudo patient stopped faking the symptom and behaved in the way they usually did. Hence the title of the study being sane in insane places. When asked by staff how they were feeling, they said they were fine. The symptom had disappeared, and could they please be released? So what was Rosenhan trying to do here? There were two aims to the study. The first one, principally, was to investigate psychiatric labels as to whether these would be used in situations where they weren't appropriate. So this was first of all a field experiment. The independent variable being the lack of symptoms in the pseudo-patients once admitted, 
and the dependent variable, the responses of the staff. But this wasn't all. Uh, and the second aim of the study was to get some data on what it's actually like to be a patient in a psychiatric hospital. Being sane in insane places, then, was also a covert participant observation study of the experience of being hospitalised in a psychiatric ward. So what did Rosenhan and his confederates find? How long would it take for their sanity to be detected by the staff? And what would they find out about life on the inside? How different were the mental hospitals of the 1970s from the madhouse of the 1890s described by Nellie Bly? Despite the fact that the hospitals chosen were not particularly bad ones, and the pseudo-patients behaved quite normally throughout their stay, none of them were ever detected by any member of the hospital staff. And this surprised even Rosenhan. I told friends, I told my family, I get out when, it's, when I can get out. That's all. Be there for a couple of days and I, then I get out. Nobody knew I'd be there for two months. Dear Evelyn, in the early 1950s, Leon Festinger and a group of fellow scientists infiltrated a UFO cult run by Dorothy Martin. Martin and her followers, called the Seekers, believed that the world would end in catastrophic floods on December the 21st, 1954. Festinger and his team wanted to know what would happen on December 22nd, 1954. Members of the Seekers cult were indoctrinated into the belief system, such that their lives revolved entirely around the belief that the world would end on December 21st. They had given up their money and normal social connections. They were surrounded by fellow believers, and these believers made up their social circle. The cult members were isolated. The end was coming. The group locked themselves away. They awaited rescue from a promised UFO. Midnight. It is the 21st of December. The morning comes. Nothing. Dorothy Martin receives a message from the aliens. The cult has saved the Earth. What happens in end of days cults the day after? The followers' beliefs are confirmed revitalized. In this case, faced with incontrovertible proof that their beliefs were wrong, the Seekers cult began evangelizing about the truth of their message. They're still going today. What's happened here is what Festinger calls cognitive dissonance. The Merriam-Webster dictionary defines this as the psychological conflict resulting from incongruous beliefs and attitudes held simultaneously. The Seekers cult, for instance, had the belief that the world was meant to end on December 21st, and the contradictory belief that the world continued past that date. This is cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is uncomfortable, and the cultists needed to resolve the conflict. They couldn't give up the first belief because they'd invested too much in it. They couldn't give up the second one because, well, the world still exists. The way they resolved their cognitive dissonance was to adopt a third belief. The cult saved the world from destruction. This is why the Seekers and cults like it don't die when confronted with contradictory evidence, but are instead rejuvenated. But cognitive dissonance isn't restricted to cults. It is a feature of our everyday lives. Often when we rationalize away irrational behavior and beliefs, we are engaging in cognitive dissonance reconciliation. I would argue that cognitive dissonance can be found in all areas of our lives. Many of us find ourselves in careers that we just don't want, but remain in because it's just for now. We enter relationships that become sour and stay with our partners because that's just the kind of relationship we're used to. We watch another and another YouTube video, whilst knowing we should be getting on with something more productive. Cognitive dissonance is not just for the crazy. Sweet dreams. On that note, here's some more videos. Come on, what's one more? I'm sure that thing you're meant to be doing can wait for four minutes. 
Okay, so now we are going to talk about the last type of observational research, which is laboratory observation. And so with laboratory observation, we are attempting to answer research questions like, are the brains of sociopaths different than non-sociopaths? Which brain structures become active when people watch violent movies? Um, and so the reason that these questions would require participants going to a lab to be observed is because uh, these research questions require special equipment that doesn't exist in the natural environment. So laboratory observation can be qualitative or quantitative. It just depends on the variable that you're measuring and how you're measuring it. But special equipment that doesn't exist in the natural environment includes things like fMRI machines, EEG machines, uh, PET scans, one-way mirrors, computers, EKG machines, plethysmographs, all of that kind of stuff. So obviously, if you wanted to study the brains of people with schizophrenia, it wouldn't make logistical sense to um, drag an FMI, fMRI machine around the town and um, you know set it up in people's houses. I don't even think that would be possible. Uh, so this, of course, would... Um, this situation would demand a laboratory. And so some of the pros of laboratory observation is that it gives the researcher a lot of control over the variables. So if you think that a person being too hot might make uh, their testosterone levels go up, you can keep the temperature of the lab at a specific um, number, at a specific temp, and then everyone would be in that same temperature. So you would be controlling for the variable of temperature affecting whatever variable it is that you're studying. Um, and then a con of this type of research is that it does create an artificial atmosphere. So there is strong potential for the reactivity effect. Um, and in turn, this would give you some low external validity. Um, if people are not behaving as they normally behave because they're in a lab, then it would be very difficult to generalize the results of your lab findings to other populations. So here is an example of a research that used laboratory observation because they needed um, they required special equipment. And so uh, this is the article that was written on that research, and I have the abstract for you here so that you can check it out. But um, in summary, basically what happened was um, they were interested, the researchers were interested in studying if homophobia was associated with homosexual arousal. In other words, are people that are homophobic actually um, gay themselves and kind of in self-denial about it. And um, so what they did to test this uh, hypothesis was have men come into the lab and the first condition of the experiment was to give all the men a survey. They called it like the sexual survey or something generic. But what it really was was a measure of homophobia. And so all the men took the survey and it let the re researchers know how homophobic each participant was. Then they took the men um, to the second condition of the experiment, which was a room with a screen and like a lazy boy chair and something called a plethysmograph that measures how aroused a person is or a man is uh, by, it's like this little device. It kind of looks like a, a latex circle and it goes around the penis and it measures the blood flow to the penis, which lets the researcher know how aroused the person is. And so um, they would have the participants sit in a chair with the plethysmograph and then watch um, basically porn. And the porn was female and male and then also male and male. And so they would just have them watch the porn and then record the results of the plethysmograph. And then at the end, the next condition after they had done that was um, they had the individual men report how aroused they felt like they got during watching the porn. Um, so what the research found is that um, the men that had low uh, scores on the homophobia scale, indicating that they were not homophobic, got aroused when they watched the female male porn, but did not really get aroused when they watched the male male porn. Whereas men who had reported high levels of uh, homophobia on the, on the survey, they um, were aroused when they watched female to male porn, and they were also 
aroused when they watched male to male porn. And then also just kind of interestingly, in that third condition where they had the people report how aroused they had been by the porn, um, they found interesting results as well, which was that the men who were not homophobic um, and did not get aroused while watching the, the male to male uh, porn were more likely to report being aroused by the male to male porn. They were like, yeah, I guess I was a little aroused. I mean, it's people like hooking up, so it's, it was kind of hot. Whereas the homophobic men who got the most aroused, they said, no, absolutely, I was not aroused during that male to male, uh, during the male on male porn when they, when they were. So that third condition did a great job measuring that uh, self-denial dimension of the homophobia. So I found some videos of people discussing this study, but they're all pretty long, like 20 minutes. So I found a shorter clip of the uh, researcher explaining why they get results like this when they study homophobia. People who have uh, homophobic attitudes, who are more prejudiced or discriminatory against gay people, are themselves more likely to have a discrepancy between their unconscious attraction to same-sex partners and what they are consciously aware of. Those people who have such discrepancies, who really have a split between their unconscious attraction and what they consciously say about themselves, are more likely to come from authoritarian homes. If uh, you're a parent who really strongly believes your child should be heterosexual, and then you use whatever means you can to convince them that they're only good and worthy if they are, this would be very controlling. This creates a lot of conflict in the child. And one, what we see in this study is one way that gets resolved is by then being discriminating or hateful towards gay and lesbian others. It may be that you yourself are divided between uh, your homosexual and your heterosexual uh, attractions. And therefore, homosexual people f feel more threatening to you. And then you express more negative attitudes toward them. So we can ask people what their conscious attitude is towards sexual orientation. We say, are you gay or are you straight? But to get at their unconscious sexual attraction, we use a different kind of task. We use a reaction time measure. So we use this pretty split second task where you have to classify homosexual and heterosexual words. And just before you're doing that classification, we're flashing the word me or other for some milliseconds just before they do that. And if uh, they are non-consciously more homosexually oriented, they'll have a quicker reaction time when the words me and homosexual come together. Another way that we get at non-conscious attitudes towards sexual orientation is to use a task where people get to browse pictures of attractive uh, men and attractive women and we look to see whether they gravitate towards same-sex uh, pictures or they gravitate toward uh, other sex pictures. We've had a lot of anti-gay public figures who've been caught in same-sex encounters and this study speaks to some of those kinds of cases that we've seen before. And then some of these public uh, cases that we've had it's really been someone who themselves has been homosexual who's been publicly campaigning against homosexuality. And here you can see that one part of them is really fighting another part of themselves. Whenever somebody has a really intense feeling towards any out group, but in this case gays and lesbians, we ought to ask ourselves why am I so concerned about that? Why is it so threatening to me? And one suggestion here is this may, this may be uh, one's own sexual orientation is a bit in question. And I think that we should raise doubts. Whenever we have those kind of strong feelings of hatred or discrimination towards other groups, we should wonder why. So here is another example of laboratory observation. This one shows the actual experiment. One of the most important methods used to study behavior in cognitive social psychology is the laboratory experiment. You can observe people's behavior, um, but you still don't really know what the causes are of their behavior. What attracts me to experimentation is that you can, in a very controlled environment, disentangle cause and effect. So you can rule out alternative uh, uh, explanations for something. 
I think experiments are a critical tool, uh, an, a, an essential tool really for social cognitive research, primarily because social con cognition as a field or, uh, is characterised by different theoretical perspectives. And within those different theoretical perspectives, researchers make statements about the causal role of particular variables. So I might say that social identification causes um, a particular outcome, like conformity, say. Okay. Now, what I need to do to, from this perspective, in order to establish the validity of that statement, is to um, isolate the relevant theoretical variables and show that by manipulating them, that actually that is indeed having the impact on the outcome variable that you're interested in demonstrating. And fundamentally, and within the kind of empirical tradition of the science, that the ability to differentiate between theories as a function of their ability to account for outcomes in that way is really critical in the way that they've evolved. So we've got to do some experiments to look at this because we've got because again if you just ask people what you think about it they'll say something. one example of a social psychological experiment is this uh, work that i'm currently doing with a phd student of mine actually a former ou student he came to us and he said he was interested in the issues of the psychology of space and i said well that's really interesting because i think this is a classic medium in which kind of identity processes play themselves out It's often done in the laboratory because of the types of outcome measures that you're interested in. It might not just be responses on a scale, they might be your physiological response or they might be some other thing like that you need to monitor very much more closely. Like, for example, if, if you're interested in my behaviour at the moment, it might be useful to do this in a controlled setting because you can film it and then afterwards you can go back over and see, well, did he do this, did he do the other? Whereas if you were just sitting in a train or in a field or doing an interview, it might be harder to code for those things. The two critical issues are control and measurement, and I think you can get that everywhere. It's just that actually laboratories are places in which it's relatively easy to do those two things. There are four conditions in the experiment which we're running at the moment. In the first one, um, somebody will walk in to a, a bare room and there will be no plants on the desk, there will be no pictures on the wall, and they'll be asked to do two tasks, both of which are timed, and there will be a questionnaire after those two tasks. The two tasks and the questionnaire are common across all the conditions. In the second condition, the participant will walk in to a completely decorated room. So we will put lots of pictures on the wall, lots of plants on the desk. The participant has no say over how those are arranged. They get on with the tasks. The third condition, the participant comes in and they are told they can decorate the room as they wish. Plants wherever they want, pictures wherever they like. Then they do the tasks. And the fourth condition is, again, just like the third, they come in, we tell them they can decorate the room, they do decorate the room, and then I come back in after a while and I rearrange the room to suit me, overriding their own designs. We have two tasks um, that the participants do that are timed. The first one of those is a card sorting task. And the reason for that is when you have cards spread all over a work surface, the eye naturally sort of flicks from one card to another and will take in quite a lot of what's going on around the desk. The second task is where they're asked to count the lowercase letters B on a single A4 sheet of paper. What we've done across those conditions is manipulate the extent to which the participant has an opportunity to impose their identity on the environment. And what we predict is those last two conditions would be very different from the control condition, the baseline condition, that when they can create an environment that suits them, their performances and their orientation to the space is much more positive, but when they can't, when their use of that space is violated, the outcomes are much more negative. The first thing to note is that you get a really big effect for the manipulation of that independent variable. The opportunities for the individual to impose their identity on the environment or to have that identity challenged are really having a massive impact on the behaviour. In fact, if you look at the, just the time taken to uh, perform this task, there's a 27% variation in the time taken. So when they're slowest is where the identity is violated. Where they're fastest is where they can impose their identity on the environment. They can decorate the room as they see fit. So not only have you got a very significant difference between the conditions, you've also got a really big one. The critical thing, though, is, again, that participants are blind to the manipulations. 
So clearly we don't say to them, well, you're in this condition, but in a minute we're going to have someone else in a different condition. I'll let you know. When the experiment's completed, then actually as part of the debriefing, we explain to them why we've done what we've done, if you like, why we've concealed from them that design. There's a slight kind of ethical issue because obviously the people who are in the condition where they got to decorate the room and then the experimenter has come in and just and taken it down, they might be quite alarmed by what's going on there and they might have felt quite uncomfortable. Well, I think it's important. It, the ethical issue there is to debrief them and explain why that was necessary. Yeah, pretty much it, yeah. We're looking to see what happens to people's productivity and happiness, hence the questionnaire, mm -hmm. when we start messing about with people's workspaces. We want to know what happens when people have freedom and when they don't, and there are four conditions. First when Craig came in and changed the environment around, um, I found it very disconcerting and it was quite confusing, um, especially in the tasks that I was performing. I felt that it did hamper my performance slightly. You were in the awkward condition, the fourth redecorated condition. <laughs> There is very little deception involved in the current experiment. Um, there's a little because in the fourth condition we ask them to design their own space and then I come in and, and mess it all about for them um, and that has a, a necessary antagonistic effect and we had to ask ethical approval for that. It's interesting that ethics, we have to be very careful, we went through ethics committee to get clearance and we had to put in a fairly extensive debrief um, which they could see beforehand, so they knew precisely what kind of ethical implications were involved. I think what's distinctive perhaps about experimental research, if you're talking about experimental social psychology, I think one of the, historically, the particular issue I think that that, that raises are the issues of deception. Often that when you do experiments, it's necessary to deceive someone by telling them something that isn't correct and looking at the effects of that on their behaviour. Most experimental social psychologists think that it is valid to deceive participants um, where there is a strong scientific case for that and where the uh, deception is not likely to cause any enduring harm for the participants in any way. Okay, so the next data collection method we are going to look at is face-to-face -face interviews, and these allow the researcher to ask open-ended questions, which are great because they give us a wealth of information. Um, and so face-to-face -face interviews are really perfect for when you want to measure variables that are kind of ambiguous in nature or multidimensional. For example, if you wanted to study faith or spirituality, um, and you don't really know as the researcher like where to start, um, you don't know all the dimensions to spirituality, maybe there's not a wealth of research on this topic already, um, then a face-to-face -face interview becomes a really great way to kind of figure out what those dimensions, what those factors of the variable are. Um, so generally this type of data collection method uh, renders qualitative data. The researcher, the observer, records what the interviewer says, writes it all down, um, and so they're writing down words and detailed notes, um, and so this is all qualitative. So face-to-face -face interviews occur, occur in real life all the time. If you're going for a job, if you are a detective and you're interrogating a witness or a potential suspect, um, this is where we see these types of face-to-face -face interviews in the real world. And as an IO psychologist, um, one of the major things that we focus on is making sure that interviews are done correctly um, and that data is being collected in a way that is valid and reliable so that the organization, the boss, can pick the right person for the job. Um, and in IO psychology, we call that fit. Uh, we get the right fit for the job. And so the best way to ensure that you get quality data um, is by using what's called the structured interview schedule. And so the researcher or the interviewer, um, if you're going to a job, would, before the interview begins, they would write down all of the questions that they're going to ask. And they would stick to only those questions. And no matter who came in to be interviewed, they would only ask the questions on that list. Um, and this way, everybody is being treated in the same way. Definitely the way we word questions, the tone of voice we use, um, kind of our vibe or our energy can affect the way people respond to our questions. And so a structured interview helps people to just stay on topic and um, not kind of 
you know, bias the results of the interview in any way. However, in, in the real world and job interviews and stuff, it's funny because us as IO psychologists will give these organizations these structured interviews and we'll say you have to use the structured interview. And then as soon as we, you know, set them off on their own to use the structured interview, they just throw it out the window. They're like, I know, I know which questions to ask, you know. Um, but it doesn't work. You, you have to make sure that you're asking everyone the same questions in the same way. But at any rate, um, so the pros of this type of data collection method is that you have the option to go right to your population. If you want to do consumer research, you can just go to the mall. If you want to research healthcare, you can just go to a hospital. So access um, generally be, is pretty easy with face-to-face -face interviews. Um, also, it allows us to have human contact with the respondents, so we're able to um, collect data on things like their facial expressions, their body language. If a question makes them uncomfortable, the researcher might record that information. Um, and then another pro is that it's easier to build rapport uh, in an interview. And so people are sometimes more comfortable answering sensitive questions if they're really like vibing with the interviewer and they feel safe being honest and open. But there are cons to this type of method as well. Um, there's potential for sampling bias if only a small minority of people agree to participate or if you did not position yourself in a central location. For example, if you want to do interviews at the mall and you stand in front of Hot Topic, the people coming out of Hot Topic might be um, systematically different from the people coming out of, uh, sh shoot, I don't know, um, a kid's store. What's a kid's store? Like the Disney store or whatever. <laughs> Right. Uh, and so you would need to make sure that you position yourself in a central location within the mall so that you are available to everyone in the sample, not just the people coming out of Hot Topic. So to be clear, let me give you a definition of sampling bias. Sampling bias is error in sampling that in, is introduced by taking items from a wrong population or by favoring some elements of a population. Um, so. Another con of this type of data collection is that obviously it's incredibly time consuming unless you have multiple interviewers, which is a good strategy rather than having one researcher interview 300 people have several interviewers um, interview all those people. And then people may not feel comfortable answering a stranger's personal questions, especially if the questions are about sensitive information like uh, sexual behavior or drug use, for example. And the reason for this, and in part, is because of something we call social desirability. And so social desirability is the tendency for people to respond in a matter that makes them appear better than they are. Um, so in terms of the interview, you don't necessarily need an informed consent when you do this method because you're not really incorporating any manipulation but you are required to disclose to the participant the purpose of the interview and how long it should take. All right, so the next data collection method we're gonna look at is the telephone interview. And the telephone interview is just calling people up on the phone to interview them. This is a really great method if you are trying to get in touch with people that are spread over a large geographic area. For example, if you wanted to uh, interview everyone in America about how they think the president is doing, it would be much faster to call them than to drive to their houses. Um, and so this can be a qualitative and or quantitative method. You can collect data in words or numbers with this, depending on what your research question and hypothesis are. Um, so there are good things about this type of data collection method. The pros are that it's cheaper and faster than face-to-face -face interviews. Um, people may feel more comfortable discussing sensitive topics over the phone than in a face-to-face -face interview. You don't have to be in the same location as the respondent. It can be more convenient for the interviewer and the respondent than having to set up a meeting at a physical location. If you're doing a study on a specific population, then you would need to get that sampling frame that we've talked about before in order to get the phone numbers and contact information for all of the people you want to contact and interview. Um, generally, this can be found through an organization or a survey sampling company. So there are companies where people just 
sign up to participate in surveys um, and so you can find a sampling frame from one of those places. And then also there are computer-aided telephone interview programs that display questions and help with data entry. So there's some really cool apps that assist with this method. But in terms of cons, it's still considered expensive compared to other methods. Um, people will hang up the phone if it takes too long. So research has shown that telephone interviews really should not exceed 10 minutes. And then there is potential for selection bias, and selection bias is a bias built into an experiment by the method used to select the subjects which are to undergo treatment. So if you're um, only given the phone numbers of people from a survey sampling company, there might be something systematically different about those people from the rest of the population, or people may screen calls that have answering machines, they may have caller IDs, they may not be home. So um, there are definitely challenges to the telephone interview. I'm sure you've had an experience where um, someone has called you on the phone and asked you to take just a couple minutes to participate in a survey. Most of us just hang up, which is why the sampling survey is so nice because you have people that have already agreed to participate, but you're not just reaching out to the population at random. Um, so those are some of the challenges that we face with this method. Okay, so now we are going to talk about the focus group. And so um, we use focus groups to answer research questions like, what could Target do to increase your satisfaction while shopping there? What services or structures would you like to see in your neighborhood? Would you like a park? So um, generally when we do this type of research, we collect data in qualitative and quantitative forms, so words and numbers. Um, it's a lot like a structured interview with about 12 people. Usually the first thing that you do is you have participants fill out a questionnaire and a, facilita a facilitator gives a presentation on a topic. Um, the facilitator asks questions and initiates or leads a discussion and then after a while the facilitator just kind of fades into the background and lets the discussion develop on its own between the participants. So usually researchers record these conversations so that they can analyze the content later to look for relevant themes, like with content analysis. Um, and these are often used as a starting point for a questionnaire development. Um, group Focus groups are often used in marketing to test ad campaigns and new products. So the pros of this type of methods are that participants can interact and generate ideas which can provide information that may otherwise be missed in an interview. Um, and the discussion between people in the group can produce important information that maybe researchers wouldn't have otherwise considered had they just done a questionnaire rather than observed this kind of in-depth discussion. And then the cons to focus groups are that a few assertive or aggressive people can dominate the entire conversation. If there is a person who is just kind of naturally shy, they may not speak up if there's another dominating speaker. And so you might end up with only the perspectives of one or two people rather than 12. But of course, there are things that you can do to kind of um, interfere as the facilitator and get the discussion back on track and get other people involved and things like that. Um, so I'm going to show you one of my favorite examples of a focus group being used in the real world. Psychoanalysts were about to move into big business and use their techniques not just to create model citizens, but model consumers. Last week's episode showed how Freud's American nephew, Edward Bernays, had been the first to convince American corporations that they could sell products by connecting them with people's unconscious feelings. But now, a group of psychoanalysts were going to take what Bernays had begun and invent a whole range of techniques to get inside and manage the unconscious mind of the consumer. They were led by Ernest Dichter. Dichter had practiced next door to Freud in Vienna, but he had come to America and set up the Institute for Motivational Research in an old mansion north of New York. This is the Institute for Motivational Research, a place devoted to the intriguing business of finding out why people behave as they do, why they buy as they do, why they respond to advertising as they do. And this is Dr. Ernest Dichter. We don't go out and ask directly, 
uh, why do you buy, why don't you? What we try to do instead is to understand the total personality, the self-image of the customer. We use all the resources of modern social sciences. It opens up some stimulating psychological techniques for selling any new product. Like the other psychoanalysts, Dichter believed that American citizens were fundamentally irrational beings. They could not be trusted. Their real reasons for buying products were rooted in unconscious desires and feelings. And Dichter wanted to find ways to uncover what he called the secret self of the American consumer. He was trying to get out of people's mind the unconscious motivations that they had for purchasing. Uh, these could be sexual, they could be psychological, they could be sociological, they could be a demand for status, a demand for recognition. There were things that people couldn't verbalize or wouldn't verbalize because they were too secret to them. They were too much a part of their nature and they, were, they would be embarrassed. They would be embarrassed if they came out and said things like this. He would interview people but not ask them direct questions but let them talk freely like you do in psychoanalysis. And that was his background. And so he said, why can't we have a group therapy session about products? All right? And so Dichter built this room up above his garage, and it, he said, we can have psychoanalysis of products. They can actually act out and verbalize their wants and needs. What we're going to do is try a couple of these uh, salad dressings. So well, let's see what happens. Here's our typical housewife. She doesn't follow the instructions. And they could be observed and watched, and other people could comment, and they could talk about it, and everybody could join in. He was the first to do this. This was absolutely the first thing that was ever done. And he had a movie projector up there where you could show advertisements and things like that, and people could react to them. And he invented the whole technique for mining the unconscious about the hidden psychological wants that people had about products. This became the focus group. It worked! Dichter's breakthrough came with a focus group study he did for Betty Crocker Foods. Like many food manufacturers in the early 50s, they had invented a new range of instant convenience foods. But although consumers had told market researchers they would welcome the idea, in fact, they were refusing to buy them. The worst problem was the Betty Crocker cake mix. Dicta did a series of focus groups where housewives free associated about the cake mix. He concluded that they felt unconscious guilt at the new image being promoted of ease and convenience. In other words, he understood that the barrier to the consumption of the product was the housewife's feeling of guilt about using it. They basically, on one hand, wanted to make it easy for themselves, but they felt guilty about it. So what you've got to do in those circumstances is remove the barrier, the barrier being guilt. The way you do that is to give the housewife a greater sense of participation. And how do you do that? By adding an egg. Simple as that. As simple as that. Dicta told Betty Crocker to put an instruction on the packet that the housewife should add an egg. It would be an unconscious symbol, he said, of the housewife mixing in her own eggs as a gift to her husband, and so would lessen the guilt. Betty Crocker did it, and the sales soared. My cake is ready. The consumer may have basic needs that the consumer himself or herself doesn't fully understand. You have to know what those needs are in order to fully exploit the consumer. Is it wrong to give people what they want by taking away their defenses, helping re remove their defenses? It seems so much longer than last year. It is. Nearly four inches longer in some models. Oh! Dicta's success led to a rush by corporations and advertising agencies to employ psychoanalysts. They became known as the Depth Boys, and they promised to show companies how to make millions by connecting their products with people's hidden desires. Dicta himself became a millionaire, famous for inventing slogans like, A Tiger in Your Tank. 
Even the marketing of the Barbie doll came from a children's focus group. And so it goes. But Dichter was convinced that this was far more than just selling. Like Anna Freud, he believed that the environment could be used to strengthen the human personality. And products have the power both to sate inner desires and give people a feeling of common identity with those around them. It was a strategy for creating a stable society. Dichter called it the strategy of desire. To understand a stable citizen, you have to know that modern man quite often tries to work off his frustrations by spending on self-gratification. Modern man is eternally ready to fill out his self-image by purchasing products which complement it. If you identify yourself with a product, it can have a therapeutic value. It improves your self-image and you become a more secure person and you have suddenly this confidence of going out in the world and doing what you want successfully. Bernard believed that that would then improve the whole of our society and become the best society on this planet. All right, so now we are going to talk about the data collection method that we are going to be using in our project for this class, which is survey research. And so we use survey research when we want to study an un unobservable mental process, like an attitude, opinions, experiences, things like that. So a survey, the term survey, refers to the action of collecting information. A questionnaire is a list of the questions or statements, uh, which we call items, that are asked when you are collecting information. So students regularly report to me that creating a questionnaire is way more complicated than they realized. Um, and there are certain things that you can do to set yourself up for success when you are creating a questionnaire. And what you, we, what you really want to do is make sure that you have defined your research question clearly. You need to understand what it is that you are trying to find out. Um, you need to have a plan for analyzing your questionnaire and you need to stick to that plan. So you need to decide at the outset if you're going to be doing a correlational study or an experimental study using your questionnaire. Whatever you decide on at the outset of the study, you need to stick with that. Um, you always want to keep in mind your hypothesis when you're writing items. You always want to keep in mind your variables um, and the operational definitions of those variables when you're writing your items. It is so, so, so important that the items you write for your questionnaire measure the variable that you're trying to measure and only that variable. A lot of students struggle with questionnaires and struggle with supporting their hypothesis because the items that they put on their questionnaire do not measure their variable. They measure other related variables, um, but not directly the variable that's in their hypothesis. Um, I think some of the reason for that is students think that the item should be real creative or out of the box or maybe not super direct, but that's the opposite of what we want. We want the items on our questionnaire that are measuring our variable to be very straightforward. Um, I one time had students that wanted to measure um, the commute that college students took to campus and they wanted to correlate that with academic academic success. And so the questions that they wrote on their questionnaire to measure the variable of commuting to school, really it should have just been a single demographic question that asked how long does it take you to get to school on average. Um, but instead they wrote a questionnaire which maybe wasn't really appropriate to measure that variable but they wrote an entire questionnaire for that variable and I remember one of the questions or one of the items that they included on the questionnaire was do you listen to podcasts um, and so podcasts whether or not someone listens to them is not a good indication of um, the the length of uh, the trip to school or the amount of time it takes to get to school or anything really that directly measures the commute. Um, 
I understand what their logic was. They thought, you know, you listen to podcasts while you drive. They're long. So if you're able to listen to a whole podcast, you must have driven for a long time. But that's a really indirect sideways kind of way to go about measuring that variable. We want to just measure the variables as straight on as we can. So again, the best way to measure someone's commute is just to ask them how long the commute takes. Um, so make sure that when you are writing your items for the questionnaire, because in this class you are required to write one questionnaire for one of your variables, and then the second variable can be measured either with a questionnaire um, or a single demographic question. Um, so when you are writing your items, you need to make sure that that item is directly measuring the variable it's written for and only that variable. Um, and so there are pros to doing the survey method, which is that they're inexpensive, they don't take very long, they're easy to analyze, it's um, easier for participants to actually participate in the research because they can usually just do it from the comfort of their home. Um, if it's like an online questionnaire, for example, or if they're just walking through the mall and somebody stops them, um, it's, it's less kind of time consuming than setting up an interview or doing a full laboratory experiment, for example. Um, and then the cons of this type of data are that people lie right on questionnaires all the time they may lie because they want to um, provide what what we call a socially desirable response they want to present themselves in the best light rather than giving us the real tea you know what i mean um and so other cons of this type of research is that people may be taking it for questionable reasons they may just be doing it to get extra credit and they don't actually care about our study and they don't actually care about giving us accurate data so they just go through and bubble in whatever answers they want um, or you know they might start out the survey with just the best intentions but then it's really long or they get bored and so they just start agreeing with all the items and when they do that it's called acquiescence um, you know selecting the answers without reading them and generally, those answers are just in agreement with whatever the item is. All right, so um, on a questionnaire, you can either have open-ended questions or forced choice questions, which we've talked about in uh, the previous chapter on measuring variables. Um, but just as a quick refresher, open-ended questions are probing questions intended to gather data and in-depth information. Examples of open-ended questions are essay questions or a structured interview schedule. And then there are forced choice um, options on questionnaires as well. And those are questions that provide a set of specific response options or items that provide a set of specific response options. And examples of forced choice response options are multiple choice, uh, Likert scales, yes or no, etc. Um, so always keep in mind your hypothesis when you're writing your items and make sure that your items are measuring the variable that you're intending to measure and only that variable. All right, so there are different ways to administer questionnaires um, and those ways can be self-administered, group administered, mail out, or the most popular internet. So self-administered is going to be referring to a paper and pencil questionnaire uh, that is read and answered by the respondent with little or no contact with the researcher. So the pros of SAQs or self-administered questionnaires are that they're cheaper and faster than interviews and then the participant has a strong feeling of anonymity. The cons are that the respondents must be able to read uh, and questions must be well written in order for participants to understand. Um, even when my students do their very best to make the items on their questionnaire super clear, there are still people that will look at the item and go, I don't know what they mean. And it's like very obvious what they mean. So clarity is key to getting reliable data from our questionnaires. Um, also, there are, like I said, group administered, and these are just where SAQs, self-administered questionnaires, are handed out to a group of people. The best thing about group administered questionnaires is that the response rate is close to 100%. When we hand out surveys in a group, 
Almost everyone takes them and finishes them. Um, but of course, the cons are selection bias. Why is this group agreeing to do this versus other groups? Is there a difference? Is there a reason for this? Is there something systematically different about these participants in this group than other participants? And then the mail out questionnaire, uh, it's quick. It's an economical method for distributing a questionnaire to a large number of respond, uh, respondents, especially respondents that are located all over the world. Um, the pros to this type of questionnaire are that people may feel more at ease answering personal questions from their home and at their own pace. And some of the cons of this type of method are that the researchers can't really be sure who completed their questionnaire. Uh, the response rate is really low with mail out questionnaires. Only about 10 to 20% come back. People don't fill them out, they just throw them away. Or they do fill them out and they forget to return them. Um, there's an increase in cost with this type of questionnaire because you have to print them out um, and make, you know, pay for all the copies. And um, then you have to mail them and pay for the postage. It's about five times more expensive than the online questionnaire. And then it's likely that the people who do respond are the people that the questionnaire is most salient for. Um, so for example, when we want to get customer feedback um, in you know organizations that are involved with retail generally, uh, people that provide feedback, you know, people that do agree to take that quick survey, generally they're mad. They didn't have a great experience. <laughs> we don't get a lot of respondents going on and on about the good things that the company is doing. Um, and so it can kind of, the data can kind of be biased in that way. And then there is the internet questionnaire, which is the most popular way to go and the way we are gonna go. And what's really great about the internet questionnaires is they are green. There is no paper or waste involved. Um, and you also don't have to take the time to distribute the questionnaires. Um, you know, using snail mail. And the pros are that it's easy to enter the data that we collect from internet uh, research. Most of the questionnaire programs provide the data on a spreadsheet for you after, you, um, are, after you've concluded your research. It's also easy to target certain groups. Like for example, for our study, we are going to want uh, college students. And so we'll just ask other psychology professors to announce our research to their class. Um, and then if they do participate in our research, hopefully their uh, professor will give them extra credit, although that's up to the individual professor. But it makes it pretty easy to get participants. Um, and then the cons are that we, as the researchers, we can't observe the people, we can't watch the way that they are responding when they're taking an online questionnaire. Um, so we don't know if they're just bubbling in answers really quickly or if they're actually taking the time to read the questions and items. Okay, so when you write a questionnaire, um, one of the things you can do when you finish is a pretest, and that's something that we're going to do when we finish writing our questionnaire, is we are going to have other uh, students in this class take our questionnaire as the pretest and then provide us with feedback on any problems they experienced or any confusion on the items that they experienced or any elements that they saw missing. So a pretest is when you have someone take your questionnaire while you monitor them to note any problems that arise. Um, and this is just to ensure that your questions are asking what you intend them to ask. Um, and then after you do a pretest and you get the feedback, you make all of the necessary corrections to your questionnaire, and then you do a pilot study. And a pilot study is administered exactly the same way as your entire study would be administered, but to a limited number of people. So it's almost like a dress rehearsal um, for your entire study. Um, and so you will be doing a pilot study assignment where you take the latest version of your survey and give it to family and friends and kind of uh, monitor them taking the survey or get feedback from them. And then this gives you one last chance to catch any problems so that you can make those corrections um, so that your survey is perfect for when you administer it to your real sample, your real participants. Okay, so uh, let's focus on what you need to do when you are writing survey questions. 
Um, since we are going to be doing a Likert format for our questionnaire, um, we will not be having any questions. We, all of our items will be statements that the participa uh, participants either agree or disagree with. Um, so however you write your survey items, they all need to be in the same exact format on the questionnaire for that variable. Um, so if I'm measuring the variable introversion, all of my items on the questionnaire, if it's in the Likert format, need to be written as statements, and all the responses need to use the same response scale, a five-point Likert scale, uh, where a one is strongly disagree and a five is strongly agree, or a seven-point Likert scale or a nine-point Likert scale, whichever one I choose, I have to use that response scale on every single item. And so when I'm writing these items, these statements on my questionnaire, it's important that I remember to keep questions short and simple. I want to avoid poetic language, flamboyant va uh, vocabulary, excessive prose. The last thing I want to do is confuse my participant. The items need to be straightforward, easy to understand. The reader of the item should know exactly what the statement means and it should not be confusing or ambiguous in any way. Um, if it's overly wordy, that can be confusing. If we use technical jargon, that can be confusing. So you want to just keep it simple. Um, research shows that generally if we write at about an eighth grade reading level, the majority of the population should be able to understand our items and what they're asking or what they're stating. Um, and so if you look on your slide, I have an example here of kind of a poorly written survey question that says, would you be inclined to the practice of locating electronic gaming machines in local drinking bar establishments? So a simplification of this would just be, are you in favor of placing video lottery terminals in local bars? Or are you in favor of placing slot machines in bars. Um, so a simpler way of asking that where people will know exactly what it is you're saying is the way to go. Um, and the next one is avoiding using and when we write our items. If we use the word and, we're usually measuring two dimensions at the same time within the same item um, of the variable. And so people might agree with one part of the item but not agree with the other part. For example, if I put, I prefer, I prefer working with colleagues who are pleasant and competitive. Um, a person might agree that they enjoy working with someone who's pleasant but disagree that they enjoy working with someone who's competitive. So they might not know how to respond to this honestly. Um, and what we often see when people don't really know how to respond is that they just put the neutral response. So if um, on your pretest and on your pilot test, you're getting a lot of neutral responses, that could be an indication that your survey items are not well written. But at any rate, uh, when questions have that word and in them and are measuring two dimensions of a variable, um, we call those double-barreled items or double-barreled questions, and they are to be avoided. Um, so if we wanted to correct this statement, what we would need to do is just simply break it into two statements. So instead of this one, it would say, I prefer working with colleagues who are pleasant, period. And then we would have another item that said, I prefer working with colleagues who are competitive, period. And that would correct for that double-barreled situation. We also want to avoid biased wording like, since all women are overly emotional, can they be effective managers? So biasing a question or an item this way might influence the way the person responds. And rather than responding with their truth, they might respond with what they think you want them to say based on the biased wording in your question. Or they might look at you as an authority figure a respected scientist, and they might just assume that the um, kind of assertions in your questions or in your statements are truthful because you're a scientist. And so they might just take a bias as a fact, and now they just think that all women are too emotional to be leaders, which is not what research supports at all. Um, so the next one is avoid double negatives, like should teens not be fined for not following curfew laws? So that's going to be confusing to anyone that reads that. Um, so you don't want to be using double negatives in your items. You want to make sure that you are very clearly 
um, stating items in a straightforward and direct way that's easily understandable by your participants. So let's watch this video on how to write survey items. How can researchers design survey questions that are clear, neutral, and that accurately measure public opinion? For starters, there are some basic principles that carry over from everyday conversation. When you're talking with someone you just met, you wouldn't assume that they're a policy expert. So you wouldn't use jargon like a continuing resolution or assume that they know what something like the Trans-Pacific Partnership is. Similarly, survey researchers can assume that respondents know about certain things. So they generally avoid asking questions that ask about obscure topics in a way that provides only limited information. Do you favor or oppose the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Respondents may have heard something about that issue and they might even have an opinion about it, but they might not know it's called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So if the survey doesn't define or explain the agreement, it can't measure the opinions of those kinds of respondents. At the same time though, survey researchers also want to avoid offering too much information in a question, as in this example. In general, that's not a good idea. It's unlikely people will pay attention to that much information, and those who do are likely to give answers that are influenced by how the issue is described meaning that they might give a different answer if asked about the same issue in a different way. A better way to measure public opinion on this topic would be to remind respondents what the TPP is without overwhelming them with arguments for or against it. Such as, do you favor or oppose the free trade agreement that the U.S. negotiated with 11 countries bordering the Pacific called the Trans-Pacific Partnership or TPP? So your question shouldn't have too much information and it shouldn't have too little kind of like the three bears with their porridge and chairs. We want it to be just right. Of course, survey questions also shouldn't lead people to give one answer over another. Consider a question like this one. In addition to the previous United Nations scandal involving mismanagement of the Oil for Food program, there are now indications of corruption in the handling of peacekeeping activities. Do you think the United States should stop paying dues to the United Nations until its problems of mismanagement are cleaned up? This question could lead people toward a potential response in two ways. First, it primes them with assertions about a scandal and corruption at the United Nations. Second, it pushes respondents to answering that the U.S. should stop paying its dues. Another fairly common mistake in survey questions is the use of a double negative. One example would be asking, whatever your overall view of the new health care law, do you favor or oppose provisions in the law that prohibit health insurance companies from denying coverage or charging some customers higher premiums based on pre-existing conditions? What does it mean to favor prohibiting denying coverage? That's confusing. A clearer approach would be to describe the current law and in a separate sentence, ask if respondents favor or oppose it, like this. Questionnaire designers also want to be wary of acquiescence bias, which is the tendency for people to simply be agreeable. Studies have shown that questions posed as yes-no or agree-disagree tend to overstate how much the public endorses something, because generally people's default position in conversation or surveys is to be nice and agreeable. So if you ask a question like, do you agree or disagree, the best way to ensure peace is through military strength, you will get a much higher share of the public agreeing that military strength is the best way to ensure peace than if you ask the same question and offer two alternative statements like, which statement comes closer to your views? The best way to ensure peace is through military strength or diplomacy is the best way to ensure peace. This forced choice format doesn't offer the respondent the chance to simply say, yeah, I agree. Not only is the wording of each question important, but so is its placement in the order of the survey. A question asked early in an interview can influence how people interpret a later question or what considerations they have in mind when answering a later question. This issue is called a context effect, and it's why most polls that measure attitudes about the president's job performance or how people intend to vote in an upcoming election, they ask those surveys at the beginning of the questionnaire. That way, when people evaluate the president, they haven't been primed to think about any particular dimension, such as their handling of health care or racial relations, and the survey can get a cleaner overall measurement. After the questionnaire is drafted, two final steps can make a huge difference. First, have people of different backgrounds review the questions. Get input from people with different political views, different religious traditions, varying levels of education, and from different parts of the country. This helps guard against asking questions that are inadvertently confusing or biased. 
Also, be sure to pretest the questions with the actual population that will be surveyed. That way you can observe respondents grapple with the questions and you can fix points of confusion or other problems before the survey goes into the field. So you can see that writing clear, neutral questions is actually a lot more difficult than it might seem. Certainly no single person can write a perfect questionnaire, but we can get closer to perfect by thinking carefully about these best practices. Okay, and so some final rules for SAQs or self-administered questionnaires are that the questionnaire should be professional, organized, clear, and easy to read. Um, so you want your questionnaire to have face validity. You want it to look legit um, so that people will take it serious. You want it to be easy to read and organized. Um, if you were to mail it, which you're not going to do, but if you were, you would need to include a cover sheet letter with sufficient information for your participants to decide if they want to participate. Um, this is very similar to an informed consent. Um, as you know, in our questionnaires, we will have an informed consent, and that will be the very first thing our participants see in our study, and they will have to agree uh, to participate and agree that they are over the age of 18 and that they understand everything that they've read on the informed consent in order to be able to move forward with the survey. Um, and then you need clear organization so that the respondent doesn't get lost or confused when filling it out. You want to place demographics at the beginning of the survey. Um, generally, the only way that you would instead place demographics at the end of the survey is if somehow those demographics give away the purpose of your study um, by, you know, kind of the demographic questions that you're asking. Um, and then when you ask for people's age, research does show that people are more comfortable giving a birth date rather than the number of years. Um, typically, we see that in older participants. And since we are studying college students, which does cover a wide uh, range of ages, the average age of our college students is generally kind of in the mid to early 20s and most of our participants are going to be comfortable just giving a straight up number of years old that they are um, and so that's how we are going to collect our data on the demographic for age um, because it is just way more straightforward and it requires less work on the back end than having to go through each participate uh, participant and figure out how old they are by looking at their birth date. Um, and then income, people are generally more comfortable answering in a range, um, and they might not actually know their exact income from their tax return last year, and so if they aren't like at home and have it readily available, it might be really difficult for them to give you an accurate answer on income if you're just asking for a number. But if you provide people with um, kind of ranges, like did you make between 50 and 100,000? Did you make between 100 and 150,000? Generally, people have a better kind of um, estimate of where they are in those ranges than providing a precise and accurate number. Um, so make sure that after you write your questionnaire items, you do go back and you check that they meet all of the APA stylistic requirements for being clear, concise, avoiding poetic language, uh, pop culture references, all that kind of stuff, um, and that they are grammatically correct, the spelling is correct, they're written at an eighth grade level, no double barreled or biased wording, um, and that everything is just really straightforward and directly measuring your variable and only your variable. Um, so I wanted to show you some polls as examples of terrible surveys um, that I found on this blog by my favorite statistics person on Twitter. Um, and so anyway, she, she has a blog and she posted a bunch of polls that she found on the app next door that are, um, pretty bad. Uh, so I'm going to show you those now. They're also kind of funny here. Let's check them out. Okay. So this first one is a poll that says anyone looking to buy a collection of beanie babies? Yes or no. Everybody put no. And it says, this is actually a pretty good scale, that one is. Okay, the next one is, poll, I'm looking for a good book recommendation. Yes, no, question mark, and how do I? 
Um, and this one says a lesson in human factors, ease of user interface use. So implying that the person didn't know how to work the poll feature on the app. The next one is poll Main Street Salon feedback about service at the salon. And then those are the response options, um, which are all replace recommend pricing. Do not recommend preferred stylists. Uh, so these response options are lacking and open to interpretation. My favorite blogger writes. The next one is poll who needs their gutters cleaned. And the options are I get the job done and take my time and get it right, and then a phone number. <laughs> Sometimes you don't need a poll at all, it says. Next one is, I'm searching for a good novel based in Germany but not about war. And then they're both question marks. And then it says no one likes open response options in their data, but sometimes they are necessary. This next one is about all the fireworks going off in their neighborhood. It says, uh, the poll options are, it's our right to blow shit up on the 4th, it's patriotic, it's rude to blow off fireworks in neighborhoods, people stop, my poor fur babies are peeing all over the house, don't you people ever friggin' sleep or it's none of your darn business. Oh, those are biased wording, yeah. The next one is a poll, I can't sleep at night, anyone got a good secret to help, it's awful. And then two locations, and it says don't build your scale while you're tired. And then the next one, how much do you love the U.S. of A. as a whole? And you have all these response options. Unconditionally, she's almost perfect. He's doing his best. She's all right. Not bad. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. I'm here. It's what I got. And I'm thinking of moving out. So a lot of biased wording and leading there. Next one is what do you love most about next door? Miscellaneous complaining, other political arguments, warnings about potential crime because the car drove by slowly, questions that can be answered on Google, fear monitoring, cheapskates asking for things for free rather than buying them, condescending reminders to lock your car doors, and gunshots when it's probably fireworks. And the blogger said she thinks it's a pretty good scale. Uh, those are all the reasons to love next door, next door. And they had another option. So, um, let's see, I'm going to skip that one about the fireworks. And the last one, do you like dogs? Yes or no, I am stupid. Okay, so those are obviously biased wording as well. All right, that is it for Chapter 11. Thank you so much for listening all the way until the end. Have a great day, and I will talk to you on the next one.